the tradition is here. The memories are waiting. Next. Minnesota Twins called Metropolitan Stadium home, and there were some superb seasons at the Met, sparked by the power of Hall of Famer Harmon Killebrew. The Twins made it to the World Series in 1965 and to the playoffs in 1969 and 1970. For the last six years, the Hubert Humphrey Metrodome, affectionately known as the Homer Dome, has been home field for the Twins, and a capacity crowd of 55,000 is on hand for the Twins' first appearance in postseason play in some 17 years. Tonight, game one between the Minnesota Twins and the Detroit Tigers. Hi, everybody. I'm Marv Albert, and welcome to the start of our prime time playoff coverage. A little bit later on, Bob Costas and Tony Kubek will be on hand to bring you the play-by-play. -play. It will be 37-year-old Doyle Alexander for the Tigers. He has been perfect since coming over from Atlanta with a record of 9-0. And for the Twins, the left-hander, 17-game winner, Frank Viola. Now, this afternoon, many of you saw the first part of our baseball doubleheader here on NBC, a game that had the Giants blanking the Cardinals 5-0 to even up the series at 1-1. One one. Bill McAtee has this report. Well, it was the Giants who got out quickly today as John Tudor ran a fastball inside on Will Clark in the second, and Clark responded with his two-run home run. The Giants led it 2-0. That would stand up, but in the fourth, Jeffrey Leonard, who had a home run last night, comes right back into almost the exact same spot. It's his second home run of the series, a solo shot. Meanwhile, the Cardinals' troubles were illustrated by this rare error by the game's best defensive shortstop, Ozzie Smith, in the eighth. Drabecki goes to distance, a two-hit shutout, and the Giants go back to candlestick with the series even at one. Enjoy the game tonight. Back tomorrow. Thanks, Bill. And while the Cardinals and the Giants are already two games into their uh, playoff series, manager Tom Kelly of Minnesota and manager Sparky Anderson of Detroit are getting set for game one. Now, Tom at 37 is the youngest manager in the Major League. So there are butterflies concerning tonight. Oh, I can't uh, lie, Marv. Uh, definitely. I'm a little bit nervous. I was nervous as early as 10 o'clock this morning and uh, got to the ballpark, I guess, 930 or so. So. Uh, we visited the bathroom twice already, so oh, I guess I'm nervous. <laughs> very, very nice. Uh, Sparky can certainly relate to that, I guess. Uh, I can. I'm yeah. just like Tommy. They tell me, they say after you've been in a few times, you don't get nervous. I was telling Tom, if you don't get nervous at this, you don't belong in the game. Now, the Twins concluded the season by losing their last five games. Not the way you want to come into tonight. Is that a concern? No, Marv, not at all. Uh, my guys are ready. Uh, we played a lot of different people uh, the last week of the season. We rearranged our pitching. We, we got some people some work that uh, needed it. Uh, they're going to be on our roster out of the bullpen. And we just changed a lot of different things around and put some people at different positions. And subsequently, we lost some ball games. But uh, guys are ready to play. We had two good workout days, and they're enthusiastic. And uh, I believe we're going to put on a good show. On the other hand, the Tigers finished in spectacular fashion. But are you worried about a, a letdown? No, we have no letdown. I said it before it starts. If Minnesota beats us, they're going to beat the best team in the American League because that's what we've been all year. And if they beat us, they deserve to beat us. But if we beat them, then we deserve to win, too. Any managerial advice from the veteran to the uh, rookie MGR? I do like I do. I keep my feet out of the runway so I don't trip nobody. And I've always said this is a player's game, and I'm not going to have much to do with it. Okay, and Tom is writing that down right now. <laughs> Okay, Sparky Anderson and Tom Kelly will be back with a look at the mysteries of the Metrodome in just a moment. And this American League Championship Series pregame show is brought to you by Taco Bell. Say hello to fresh, exciting taste. Just say hello, Taco Bell. And by Lennox. When it comes to heating and air conditioning, you can't do better than Lennox. to the Twin Cities. We are at the Metrodome in Minneapolis, which has not been a favorite ballpark for the opposition. In fact, to visiting teams, the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome is a sinister edifice. The primary cause of such trepidation is Minnesota's record at home this season. 56 up, 25 down. Opponents have even turned to the bazaar in search of a reason for the Twins' dominance at home. I know they have better cuts at curveballs that are pretty good curveballs at home than they do on the road, which leads me to one thing. Maybe they're getting the signs. 
Some people also believe that the Twins hitters might be getting the signals from the center field cameraman or some accomplice that might be out there helping him. But that center field area is always packed, and uh, they all seem to have good cuts at home and not on the road, and the record indicates they play well. I think they're getting a sign somewhere. The next item would be the air conditioning system in the Metrodome. A lot of teams theorize that the air conditioning can be turned on and off to the Twins' liking, which would govern the flight of the baseball, meaning that the ball could carry a lot farther or could not carry at all. A lot of people think that the lights in the Metrodome and the outfield are far below standards. It seems to me that there's a, at least one questionable ball hit every game into, let's call it the Metrodome Triangle, where it's completely lost. But a visiting team playing six games there during the course of a season really has trouble following the flight of the ball in the dome. For their part, the Twins perpetuate the aura of their home field advantage at every opportunity. The reason why we play so well in the dome is because we turn the fans on when we hit for home runs and blow them in when the other team's hitting. <laughs> Well, I guess things can be on the humorous side when you're 56 and 25 at home. Throughout our coverage of this American League Championship Series, we are delighted to be joined by Don Sutton of the California Angels, a man who has won 321 games, a future Hall of Famer, a man who says he doesn't mind at all pitching here at the Metrodome. But, Don, how do you react to the charges that have been made about this ballpark? Well, I think it's kind of stupid to think you could recycle the air conditioning, but as far as being familiar with the, all the conditions, it has to help playing 81 games here. What about stealing signs? Uh, does it matter if they are successfully being stolen? Can a club put them to good use? Well, there's no doubt in my mind they would try that. From the monitor, I don't know. From the center field camera, I don't know. 1982 and 1983 with the Milwaukee Brewers, we had every catcher sign, and we scored a lot of runs. We didn't always win, but we had some good cuts. On the other hand, can this be merely a psychological edge, even if things aren't being done, that uh, opposition clubs can't be bothered by it? Oh, definitely. Ball clubs have personalities just like people. And I think that the environment plays a big role in that. If you're a home team and you think that you have an advantage, it's like starting the game ahead two to nothing. If you're a visiting club and you think that you have an uphill climb, it's going to be tough to overcome that. I've come in here with three different ball clubs, and on two of them, I've had players come up on the flight in and say, hey, I don't know how you've done here before, but we don't win, so don't expect too much. And you can certainly relate to creating one's own environment uh -huh. out on the mound with uh, folks who feel he might be uh, doing a little something with uh, the baseball. That could be uh, psychological. I only carry pictures of my kids. You know that. I buy it now. Perfect. Perfect. We'll be back with the uh, wild and the wacky involving the Tigers and the Twins. Minneapolis, where we are closing in on game time. Now, last night, prior to the start of the giant Cardinal series, we showed you the wild and the wacky involving both National League playoff teams. Well, our crack staff has been working overtime, not getting much for it, but they are a happy group. And they have put together the lighter moments, what we call the Albert Achievement Awards, focusing on both the Tigers and the Twins. And we open with the Tigers, Jack Morris, and one of the wilder pitches of the season. How about relief man Willie Hernandez, not pleased with his outing and doesn't hold back his emotions. Here's George Bell with the pop foul. Here comes Tom Brookins. But it's Mike Heath moving into your picture, and it's Heath able to hang on. Not the case here. Chet Lemon with a problem losing it in the lights. And last week, the photographers who are allowed on the field in Detroit are sent every which way. The Minnesota Twins also had their share of adventures. During a pregame TV interview, an unsuspecting Joe Negro takes an errant throw off the shoulder. Then in one of the most celebrated moments of the season, Joe Negro in the spotlight for an equipment check that produced strong Emory board evidence. Off the fly to center, Kirby Puckett able to successfully fend off the Seagulls in Toronto. First baseman Ken Herbeck not able to fend off this bouncer. And Tom Bernanski, the victim of the most unique hit by pitch of the year, takes it in the armpit and uh, takes it well. So much for the wild and the wacky. And for the Twins and the Tigers, there was nothing at all wacky about their run to their division titles. 
capped off by these memorable moments. Herbeck plays behind him, and a little fly ball to the second base. Well, Albert Rosie, the throw to first, they got it! The Twins win the championship! Twins win, 5-3! Capper could be the ball game! Tanana, Evans, Tigers, champion! And now the Tigers and the Twins buy for the American League pennant in game one of their best of seven. For the introduction of the lineups, let's go to Minnesota public address announcer Bob Casey. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening, and welcome to the Hubert Rachel Humphrey Metrodome and the first game of the American League Championship Series. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for the Detroit Tigers starting lineup for game one. The only manager with 100 win seasons and world championships in both leagues. Number 11, manager Sparky Anderson. A 10-year veteran who gets better with age. Number one, second baseman Lou Whitaker. A four-time National League batting champion. Number seven, designated hitter Bill Matlock. with great speed and power. Number 23, left fielder, Kirk Gibson. The odds on favorite to be the American League's MVP. Number three, shortstop, Alan Trammell. He posted the highest batting average of his career in 1987. Number 31, right fielder, Larry Herndon. One of the premier center fielders in the game for 12 seasons, number 34, center fielder Chet Lemon. Baseball's first 30 homer hitter at the age of 40, number 41, first baseman Daryl Evans. A solid nine-year veteran of the Detroit Tigers, number 16, third baseman Tom Brookins. A great throwing arm and a competitive, spirited player, number eight catcher, Mike Heath. And warming up in the bullpen, one of the great comeback stories of many years, number 19 pitcher, Doyle Alexander. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome tonight's starters for our Western Division champion, Minnesota Twins. championship in 17 years, number 10, manager Tom Kelly. A spark from, a spark went from the old school, number 32, left fielder Dan Gladden. Just possibly the league's most improved player, number seven, shortstop Greg Gagne. The complete player, baseball's home run robber, number 34, center fielder, Kirby Pickett. One of the game's great offensive and defensive players, number 14, first baseman, Kent Herbeck. and then terror in the clutch, number eight, third baseman, Gary Gaetti. Coming off a great second half, number 25, designated hitter, Randy Bush. One of the twins, three, 30 home run hitters, number 24, right fielder, Tom Brenetsky. Baseman Steve Lamadouzi. A hometown favorite with outstanding power, number 15 catcher Tim Lutner. And warming up in the bullpen, the winningest left hander in baseball in the last four years, number 16 pitcher Frank.
ready. It will be Frank Viola. Doyle Alexander as the American League Championship Series gets underway. I am Marv Albert, Bob Costas, and Tony Kubek will bring you the action right after this NBC News Digest. NBC Sports presents... The 1987 American League Championship Series. Tonight, from the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome, it's the Detroit Tigers versus the Minnesota Twins. And it's brought to you by the Miller Brewing Company, sole sponsor of the U.S. Olympic Training Centers. By Pontiac, America's road car company. Pontiac, we build excitement. By Kellogg's Corn Flakes, what more could you want from a cereal? And by the Prudential, going above and beyond to meet your needs in insurance and other financial services. A cool, clear October night in the Twin Cities. Temperatures in the high 40s as game time approaches. But, of course, that's outside. Inside, in the controlled conditions of the Metrodome, the Twins have thrived. The best home record in all of baseball. Hi, everybody. Bob Costas, along with Tony Kubek. Welcome to this best-of-seven battle for a ticket to the World Series. Now, when you talk about the surprising Twins and their great home record, there's a flip side to that story. Yes, they were best at home of all 26 teams in the majors, but they also had the worst road record of any division or pennant winner in the history of baseball. Four of the seven games in this series, if it goes that far, would be at the Metrodome. So in theory, they could make it to the World Series without ever winning a game on the road. To keep the home field advantage, they need a good game tonight from left-hander Frank Viola. He was 17 and 10. He's opposed by Doyle Alexander, an absolute godsend for the Tigers. They got him down the stretch from Atlanta. They won all 11 games he pitched. His record, 9 and 0. Now, when you think of the Twins, you think immediately of a 5 foot 8 inch keg of dynamite named Kirby Puckett. Here he is with Tony. All right, Bob, thank you. Kirby, is there any way to explain the dominance that the Twins have had in this ballpark and the futility on the road? Uh, I really can't explain it, Tony. I don't know. We just feel that uh, when we're home, you know, nobody can beat us. Regardless if we're down five rounds or seven rounds or eight rounds, we feel that as long as we got that last at bat, we've got a chance, and that's what we try to do. Anything to do with the hitting conditions or the fielding conditions? Well, I'm sure they're much better in Detroit. <laughs> that's what we want it to be, but uh, everybody complains about the dome, but I think about this time of year, it's the best place to be. You are severe underdogs to the Detroit Tigers. Is that a familiar feeling for you? Well, yeah, throughout my career, I've always been underdog, you know, because of my size. Guy says, you ain't going to do this, you ain't going to do that. But uh, I, did, I just proved them wrong. Just went on, just let my ability to just take over. And that's the way I'm playing about it this year. Just go out and play the way I played all season, and hopefully it'll be good enough. Tom Kelly, your manager, seems to be very loose before this league championship series with the Tigers, and your whole team seems to be that way. Well, uh, we're underdogs. I mean, underdogs aren't supposed to be tight. The pressure's all on Detroit. So we just going to go out every day in, uh, uh, in this series and hopefully uh, pull it out for you, Tony. Kirby, do you feel that uh, teams come in here and they get a little frightened of this? Dome because of the conditions? Well, I think so, because uh, it's been some crucial plays uh, since I've been here, since 1984, that uh, guys have missed pop-ups, and, you know, little things happen. And uh, I think guys are a little weary of that. They come in, they go, oh, man, hope the balls will come to me. I know the outfielders are going, don't hit it to me, don't hit it to me. But uh, uh, I think teams are uh, uh, really weary of coming in here, though. How can you win this thing? Uh, I really don't know. I think that if we play the way we've been playing, I think we'll be okay. Kirby, our thanks to you. Good luck. All right. Quite a thrill for you. The fans are looking forward to seeing you in the Minnesota Twins all over the country. All right. Thanks, Tony. We'll be back after these messages. Frank Viola at age 27, a native of Long Island, set to go to work, pitched at St. John's. In the last four seasons, he's won 18, 18, 16, and then this year, 17. That 2.90 ERA, second in the American League, behind Jimmy Key's 2.76 for Toronto. Whitaker to start it. Breaking ball wrapped down to first. Herbeck alone, one out. Now it'll be Madlock, a key man for Sparky Anderson, against left-handers this year. 
the Tigers are just two over 500. They're 71 and 39 against right handers. So they don't have that much strong right handed hitting. They got Madlock and Morrison after the start of the season to bolster themselves in that area. Fastball foul back. And remember that Madlock has gotten those 50 RBIs in just over 70 ball games. So he's been a big plus from the right side. Viola, perhaps, next to Mark Langston of Seattle, has the best raw stuff among any left-hander in the American League, including Higuera, Key, Lee Brandt, and even Bruce Hurst. He's ahead of the four-time batting champion, 0-2. And, and it dips low. The plate up is Joe Brinkman. Derwood Merrill at first, Drew Coble at second, Al Clark at third, right field line manned by Jim McKean, left field line Mike Riley. The one two. Inside two and two. And you can see how hard Viola is capable of throwing in the 90s at times, has come up with a great circle change similar to what Doyle Alexander throws and will use it many times deep in the count even three and one and three and two. And wow. now it's full. He is throwing hard. And of course, if he's humming like that with the fastball, it'll make the great straight change all the more effective. Has a good curve. Sometimes he has trouble with it getting over the plate. And he can come out throwing as hard as he can now because they've got Reardon at the end, which is a plus for this team. He got it. Two out, nobody on, top half of the first. And here's the MVP of the 84 League Championship Series, Kirk Gibson. He had 417 in a three game sweep of Kansas City. Then went on to hit 333 against the Padres in the World Series with two homers. Kirk Gibson appears, Bob, since that three-game series in Detroit like he's moved off the plate against left-handed pitchers. He wasn't that far off the plate. He's maybe going to go into the ball and hit the ball straight away or to left field off by owner, or at least try to. I don't know why he'd want to do that, though, with that short porch in right field here. Unlike most new parks, the Metrodome is asymmetrical. 327 down the right field line, 343 to left. Got in on him and blew it past him. Far away at the center, there's that tall canvas in right. Wasn't there the first year it was here. Be they put it up because of so many ground rule doubles. Still very attractive in right field. Boy, is he throwing hard. Two and two. This might be adrenaline. That can put a couple extra miles per hour on your fastball. And sometimes the adrenaline this early pumps too hard and you throw yourself out. But again, they know Reardon's there for the eighth and ninth, something they didn't have last year or the year before. They do not have to pace themselves and save anything for the last couple of innings. Not anymore with his twins pitching staff. The winner of this year's American League Roll Age Relief Man Award for the second season in a row, Dave Rigetti. Presenting the award, John Walsh, president of American Chicken, makers of Roll Aids. Thanks, Mel. Roll Aids never forgets what relief means, so we're proud to recognize the league's top relief man with this award. This year, once again, Roll Aids spells relief, Dave Rigetti. Thanks, John. And thank you to Roll Aids. And I also like to thank everyone for helping me throughout the season. Thirty seven year old Doyle Alexander apparently uninspired with the Braves now turn the page and look at what he did with the Detroit Tigers 
They also won two other games he started where he was not involved in the decision. He pitched three complete game shutouts, including one at Fenway, where he retired 26 of 27 after a couple of first inning hits by the Red Sox. He combined with Mike Henneman for two more shutouts and had a game in the last week against Toronto where he went 10 and two thirds at Toronto. He has been all but unhittable. He just gave the side to his catcher Mike Heath that he's going to just show those twin center the knuckleball as they watch from the side. He may throw a few during the ball game. He's a masterful technician. Very concerned about mechanics as is the great Tom Seaver changing the arm angle. Draws that line for his pivot front foot straight toward home plate, so he steps in the precise precise spot every time. Great change up, sneakier than you think with that fastball. He'll get the fastball up to 87, 88, but mix it in with all the off-speed breaking stuff he can throw with pinpoint control. It looks faster. Somebody asked if experience will mean anything. 19 of 24 of the Tigers have been in postseason play Sparky advantage where the might come in is Doyle Alexander against a free swinging ball club and Joe Brinkman was the umpire in the Toronto game the last game that Doyle pitched against Toronto and the farther those guys swung at the pitch the farther out he moved and he played Brinkman and he played the hitters. Here's Gladden breaking ball toward the hole and a diving play by Brookings. He throws him out. Terrific play by Brookings to open the last half of the first. Playing it in front of the bag for Gladden because Gladden has the most pure speed on this ball club. Well off the line because Alexander likes almost everyone to play defensively straight away. He wants them to hit the ball in the big part of the ballpark center field. Brookings missed the final game of the season against Toronto. He was in a hospital with a bad virus. Still a little bit ailing. He just makes a tremendous play on the turf. That brings up Gagney. Who had an 0 for 30 dive in late August, early September that spoiled his batting average, but he had a fairly productive season with the bat. Floats one up there high. Alexander has been traded seven times, been a free agent twice, released once. He's seen it all in a long big league career. Comes sidearm for a strike. And right there you saw the sidearm fastball that was right near the outer edge. And if Brinkman gives Alexander that pitch, as he goes along with his series of pitches, Heath will move farther outside and keep testing Joe Brinkman to see what he'll give him. One and two. Alexander is very blunt. When you ask him about all the different teams he's pitched for, he said, hey, I have no loyalty. I'm loyal to whoever pays me. He's gotten traded more often than not, not because of his lack of ability, because he's a maverick. And there's his first strikeout. Came sidearm with some kind of dipping breaking ball, and he had Gagne completely fooled. Sparky, since about a month into the season, and really for the benefit of young catcher Matt Noakes, but with Heath coming back over from the National League, he charts every pitch as what series. All right, here he is. They list him at 5'8 and 220. Guy is built like a bowling ball. And he takes a strike. Kirby is 26 years old. You saw the power numbers with the 20. Kirby for the Supreme Court. I thought he's running for governor with Bernanski as uh, campaign manager. <laughs> you saw his power numbers. You know, coming into last season, he had four lifetime homers and over 1,200 at bats. This one is out of play. Then last year he explodes for 31 homers, and this year tacks on 28. Well, everybody knows by now, just look at the body. He was into weightlifting, the smallest kid on the block, and he was expected to be a leadoff hitter, hit the ball on the ground and run like heck and hit for singles until Tony Oliva got home before last year. 0-2 pitch in the dirt. This Twins team does not like to take a lot of base on balls. Bernanski and Herbert will take some, but most of the team is a free swinging ball club. And that's why in Alexander, with all the different arm angles, change of speeds, if they want to get themselves out, he won't throw them strikes. 
Two and two to Kirby Puckett with Ken Herbeck on deck. He struck him out. So both Viola and Alexander fan two in the first. To the top of the second we go and we'll return to the Metrodome in a minute. Frank Viola's brother John is scheduled to get married on October 17th and Frankie's supposed to be the best man. That's also the day the World Series opens. So if Viola pitches well against the Tigers, he might have to miss the wedding. That sign you saw on the split screen, it was in the right field corner. Frank Viola's begun leaving tickets for the young man who printed it because he is 15 and 0 with that sign hanging out there, a certain man says. A strike to Trammell, the PA man, described Trammell as the odds on favorite for yeah. the American League MVP award. It's going to be very close between Trammell and George Bell, and probably Puckett of Minnesota will finish third. Up in his eyes, and he grounds it down to third. Gaetti, who won a gold glove last year, throws him out. We have a chance to see some outstanding defensive play by the Minnesota Twins at the corners. You talked about Gaetti's gold glove. He has terrific range to his right, can be acrobatic. And when you really look at Gaetti and Herbeck, who's also outstanding, there are very few teams in the major leagues have that kind of strength defensively at the corners. I guess you'd have to go to Tim Wallach and Andres Galarraga with Montreal, the big cat at first base. So they are outstanding, and they play this turf well. Herndon, who's homer on Sunday, finished the Blue Jays. Takes a strike. Platoons now in right field with Pat Sheridan. Starting against the left-hander, just low. That will be interesting, Bob, and uh, Sparky Anderson has not yet said, because at the end of the year, Scott Lucader, the kid who was not eligible for postseason play, was platooning with Herndon. After the home run, it was Sheridan slumping at the end. Perhaps Herndon will play against all kinds of pitching. Here's a fastball and a towering fly ball toward the right field line. And Baranski for the pass. And you will notice Minnesota Outfielders and infielders do not take their eye off the ball. It is not as bad as it was two years ago. They've added extra lighting. You see visiting players come in, they find the ball off the bat, pick a spot to run to, and they can no longer find the ball. But these Twins players, since the speakers you sit with, they put additional lights two years ago to take some of the shadows away. It has helped defensively on pop ups but still can be a problem at times. They also changed the turf two years ago. It is not nearly as springy as it used to be. You'll still get AstroTurf extra base hits as you would in Toronto or at the Kingdome or in St. Louis. But it used to be a travesty here. It's improved somewhat. Lemon takes a change for a strike. That's what Dick Such, the Twins pitching coach, has worked long and hard with Viola. Change speeds on your curveball, do different things with your fastball. There he just ran and slumped the fastball away instead of coming in with the real hard one he threw in the first inning. Now he's got the one he wants and the one one pitch is a fastball right at the letters and Lemon swings late. They are underdogs with Viola and Bly 11 pitching tomorrow. Very capable of shutting out any team in baseball on any given day. And those games in water lost on that 16 foot dirt surface out there more often than not. One and two. Viola got two strikeouts in the first. And here's a bouncer up the middle. Lombardozzi won't get it. And that's the game's first base hit. Alex Gramis, the third base coach for the Tigers, will not try too many things, nor will these base runners like Lemon, on the center field arm of Puckett. Gramis knows it's a fast surface. Puckett has great hands, not on ground balls and fly balls, one of the strongest, most accurate arms. So Trzuski and Gramis, the first and third base coaches, will not run a whole lot on Puckett's arm. 
And the continuing marvel, Darrell Evans steps in, 34 homers at the age of 40. Ball one. Just another one of the reasons I love to throw left-handers against the Tigers. Evans bat, Whitaker's bat. Get Matt Noakes, the rookie sensation bat out of there. And of course, Kirk Gibson's left-handed bat also. Lemon is back. Take a look at Gaetti over at third base. He's given Evans all of the line over toward the shortstop's position. Meanwhile, Gagney's practically back of second. Here's a long drive that is hooking foul. It had more than home run distance. Who says a 40-year-old's bat speed has to slow down? Advanced scouting reports will still tell you, unless you get the ball belt high and up and in on Evans with something on it, he can still get around and pull almost anybody's fastball, especially if it's down in that area. Outstanding low ball hitter. As hard as Val is throwing, they're still playing way around the pull for him. Gladden way off the line and left. One and two. Bob, is it me, or is there about as much din as I've ever heard in the ballpark? It isn't closed, and the sound doesn't go out in the open air, but the fans here are just fantastic to open this game here for the ALCS. They are psyched wow. up, but good. 50,000 plus. The one-two pitch. And it holds there as a traditionalist, and I know you're one too, Tony. You can't like dome stadiums, but one thing you have to say, you go to a football game when the Seahawks play, or baseball last year in the playoffs, the Astros and Mets, or the atmosphere here, it can really get to a fever pitch. Ready has in game one. It's a home field advantage almost like a basketball game in that sense. Another one-two pitch. There is something in experience of the Twins pitchers and the youth of this team could subconsciously, subconsciously affect an umpire. Doyle Alexander, experienced, known as a control pitcher, may get more of the outside corner. That pitch like it was right on the edge to Evans, and the call as Viola really was walking to the dugout went to Evans. Of course, Evans has walked 100 times this year. That makes a difference also. And he struck him out. That's three for Viola. No runs a hit. A man is left to the last of the second. No score in Minneapolis. That fence is only seven feet high, and that allows Kirby Puckett to get back there. And though he's only 5'8", he can dunk a basketball. He's able to leap up over that and pull potential home runs back. And then the blue monster out there in right field. With the canvas, it's 23 feet high and just 327 down the line. It's called a curtain. Some derisively have called it a hefty bag. You know, Bob, uh, with the old turf and with the conditions before, a condition where the ball made it more bouncy and traveled farther, there was like one or two ground rule doubles every single series of the year. This year, there are 15 or 16 ground rule doubles because of the turf, of course, not as lively. Here's the man they're going to, want to pitch her out, the right-handed pitchers, and it's all right-handed pitchers scheduled at this point for Spark Anderson in the first three games, starting. And he might not use Tanana in game four. That's fouled off to the left and out of play. You can see the little auxiliary boxes there, and that gives less foul territory for the third and first baseman. Outside one and one. If that's an advantage for anybody, probably the Tigers, because Herbeck, the younger man, very agile despite his great size, is terrific at going down the yes, line on foul pops. Evans at 40 wouldn't be as good. Inside two and one. Alexander, a couple of hard pitches in tried. Inside trying to straighten Herbeck up in that crouch. Herbeck, the man who used to change his stance every time he had an offer. Now he's in that crouch with a bat on his shoulder, almost like Don Mattingly. Had him fooled on that one, two and two. What's the old Warren Spahn quote? Hitting is timing. Pitching is upsetting timing. If anybody understands that, it's Doyle Alexander. Doyle not 
make sure the count, I believe, wants to make sure. It's two and two. Down the left field line, racing over Gibson into foul ground for the catch in the bullpen. This staff and the Minnesota Twins are predominantly right-handed hitting. Bush is in there today, and of course, Herbert will just fly out. But Alexander, Morris pitching the mile, and Terrell, first game, have a tremendous facility to prevent left-handed hitters getting the ball in the air to right field. They run the fastball away. When they come inside, they come inside bad. And it's awfully difficult to pull these guys when they're right, no matter how strong you are, and even if you're a natural pull hitter. Gaetti takes a ball. He's the first twin to drive in over 100 in consecutive years since Harmon Killebrew in 1970 and 71. You just saw another example of what Doyle Alexander means when he changes the arm angle. Tom Kelly spent a lot of time playing baseball. His father managed in the semi-pro league here, and that's how he got to know Minnesota people. The youngest manager of the majors, Andy McPhail, from the long line of McPhails. A great fan of Kelly's, and boy, he's really made a difference along with Reardon with his club. That's fouled out of play. Andy McPhail is the 34-year-old general manager who has teamed with Kelly to take them not only to their first winning season since 1979, but all the way to the top of the American League West. One and two. There he goes, playing with the outside corner again. And that's really why you see this kind of defense. Brookins off the line, even for pretty much a pull hitter in Gaetti. Travel playing straight away, as is the center fielder. But Doyle, when he first came to the ball club, told Spark in the first pitcher's meeting and catcher's meeting, he said, I want all my guys against everybody to play straight away. I want to make them into the long part of the ballpark. Randy Bush on deck. Check swing roller down to Brookins. And he throws over to first to quiet the crowd a little bit. What you saw the folks waving as Gaetti made the tour around the bases. The Homer Hanky, which is something of a fad here in Minnesota. Fastball up out of the plate. Basically speaking, if you had to categorize this Twins team, you'd say fastball hitting ball club, relatively free swinging. Gaetti likes the ball up more than down. And he got one up and out over the plate. Lunansky drives one to right, but it's foul. You know, Bob, this, when, when this ballpark first came into existence, before they put the air conditioning, it was named the Homer Dome, and rightfully so. And as you mentioned earlier, since they've air conditioned it, the ball does not carry, except when you get a lot of people in here, 50,000 plus today, more humidity, more heat. It's cold outside, so there's no air conditioning on. And Sparky said the ball's going to fly, and it's going to. A jam shot down to Evans, and that'll do it. Gaetti puts the twins in front, and we'll be right back after these messages from your local station. You can't turn on the TV or radio in Minneapolis without hearing a song called My Baby Waves the Homer Hanky, with apologies to Tommy James and the Shondells, and Gaetti got him waving in the second. The audio file I am, I've got all their compact discs. I would go anywhere to find that kind of music. Well, there is a lot of money, money at stake <laughs> in the postseason. I'll tell you, he crunched one pretty good. High outside fastball, straightaway center field. And that ball really carries in that direction in this park. Viola stake to a 1 0 lead. Starts Brookings with a strike.
and two. One thing Tom Kelly insisted on, and to Tom Kelly's left is Dick Such, the pitching coach, is improvement in the little phases of the game in spring training. There's Joe Nico with the jacket on, may not pitch. He's had a little shoulder problem. But their defense has improved. They move base runners better than he did the last couple of years, and Kelly's a strict fundamentalist. That's the great circle change. He holds it in a similar fashion. If you want to know what it looks like, you just put your finger together, give the AOK -okay sign, touch the pointing finger to the thumb. And what Viola does, unlike Darling's Edge, he spreads his little finger, the one next to wide apart, and rolls off the one finger, looks like a screwball. I believe Don Sutton, who did some pregame work with Marvin Albert, throws one like that and has for years. Heath sends one toward the gap in left center. Back goes Kirby Puckett all the way to the fence. He can't even leap for this one. It is out of here to tie the game. And boy, did that ball ever take off. It was hit so hard that Kirby couldn't get back there in time to even think about a leap, and he plays a very deep center field. So he, who hit eight during the regular season. <laughs> you see the expression on Sparky's face as if to say, where did you come up with that power, son? He was going to give him the cold shoulder silent treatment. He got him back in the ball game. Against left-handers, they're without Noakes, who as a rookie hit 32. So you'd think they'd be giving something away. Not here. Amazing how quiet 50,000 can be. A ball to Whitaker. Usually early in the game, and that's why it was kind of strange. Whitaker jumped on the first pitch. Madlock swung on the first pitch before he struck out. The Tigers like to make you throw a lot of pitches. They're experienced. They want to see everything you've got. Try and wear you down. And middle relief at times has been a problem for Minnesota till they get to Reardon. Of course, the Tigers have had a similar kind of problem. Relief pitching except for Henneman. Two and one, and Viola might have gotten a break on that call from Joe Brinkman. Hard shot. Herbeck has it. Kelly flatly says that Herbeck is the best defensive first baseman in the American League, and he's mindful of how good Don Mattingly is, but Herbeck is his choice. Billy Gardner, who manages ball club and has been in baseball 40 years, I believe, said that he's the best first baseman he has seen in his 40 years in baseball, which he didn't see much of the National League with Hernandez. But Billy Gardner saw people like Vic Powers, who was exceptional, and Gil Hodges, who was exceptional. Ferris Fain, who was a left-handed thrower, but Herbeck is very agile, but playing with a pull muscle deep in his stomach, but could affect him for this series is over with. Madlock grounds one foul. We're reminded by Heath's homer that the Tigers led the majors in this homer happy season with 225, the second highest total for a season in baseball history. Allen hit his foot in the batter's box. All and two. Tony Kubek contributed eight or nine to that total of 240. Got to remember that 61 was without a designated hitter, as was the 47 Giants and those 56 Reds. And the 63 so twins. twins of Allison and Killebrew and the rest. That's a terrific point. Without a DH, makes the accomplishment all the greater. Viola fan Madlock in the first. And he does it here. Five K's for Viola. But Heath equals Gaetti, and we go to the last half of the third. American League Championship Series is brought to you by the people of Holiday Inn Hotels who salute you. Here's to the winners 
We're on your way, and by RCA, the most trusted name in electronics. In contrast to the young combination of Gagne and Lombardozzi for the Twins, when you look at the Tiger defense, in the middle, you see Alan Trammell and Lou Whitaker, each a 10-year veteran, and they've been together longer than any DP combination in the history of baseball. Six to four, Trammell and Whitaker perhaps have made more 6-4-3 double plays than any Major League double play combination in history. That day in 77 was Ralph Hout, who was the manager for the Tigers, put them into the lineup and said they have no more to learn in the minor leagues. And Hout is now vice president and a consultant for the Minnesota Twins. Lombardozzi, Laudner, and Gladden in the last half of the third. Day before yesterday, Lombardozzi was in the video room in the Twins clubhouse looking at his at-bats against Alexander. And I heard him say repeatedly as he watched pitches he took for strikes or swung through, what was that? Chopper toward Trammell. Low throw, Evans digs it out. Allen has had trouble on occasion over the last few years with elbow problems and a little tenderness in the shoulder, the rotator cuff. Doesn't have quite the zip he had a couple of years ago because of some of those injuries. It's interesting, though, about Lombardozzi. He's as baffled by what Alexander throws as we are sometimes from up here. Isn't everybody? I mean, the man finishes 9 0. You expect those kinds of finishes from power pitchers, whether it's a Gibson or a Clements or, or a Koufax. But a finesser like he is, it's an extraordinary finish. The graphic short changes Laudner. He's hit 16 home runs, but the batting average was accurate, a buck 90. He will throw from to the side for two hitters who like the ball inside of the plate or middle in. When he comes to the side, he can throw fastball. One of the few that throws a changeup from down from the side and also the slider you just saw. Two and one. and on the outside edge. And if Joe Brinkman, and we mentioned this earlier, continues to give that pitch to Doyle Alexander, it could be a long day for the right-handed hitters for the Twins. Doyle Alexander threw that one pitch to Gaiety up. Now he's back down in the strikes. So when he comes up, he comes up and usually moves the guy off the plate. Laudner fans for the second out of the last half of the third. There's probably no pitcher in either league who can play on the hitter's weaknesses, pitch to their strengths, but if you're a low ball hitter, by that I mean, he pitches lower than your strike zone. It makes you go after bad low pitches. If you like the ball away, he'll pitch away six inches out of the strike zone to make you go at it. So he kind of tantalizes you, and he can execute it. Gladden was robbed on a diving play by Brookins in the first. We looked at Whitaker and Trammell, the veterans up the middle. Now they help a guy like Alexander because they've been around so long they'll position themselves and anticipate based on what he's going to throw and he'll hit the spots consistently. You love to play defense behind a guy like Alexander. Well as Alan Trammell has said and Lou Whitaker who doesn't talk a whole lot said the same thing with a guy like Alexander even more than Morris or Terrell we can lead. In other words if the location is put down after the sign. And that particular pitch, Trammell could lean to the middle of the diamond to his left because if the target was away and Doyle Alexander's close to it. Two one pitch to Gladden. Ran up and tried to drop a bunt. Two and two. Looking for the appeal down to first base up by Derwood Merrill. He pops the right hand up. Derwood Mel, an interesting story. Derwood was. He kind of raised Billy Sims, the great running back with the Lions, and this is the field on the old turf that Billy Sims' career was ended. Twisted his knee, tore it up. Here again, that sidearm changeup, and look at the arm speed, and he follows through so and disguises it so well. It was a good pitch to bunt a changeup, it was way out of the strike zone. The 
Twins set an attendance record this year. They drew 2,081,000, and that with the smallest season ticket base in the majors. They had just 4,000 tickets a game sold by opening day. Look at how he spread out for that changeup. And he hits this one to left. Gibson almost in his tracks makes the catch. A perfect third for Alexander. Now here's a look back at a very special Olympic moment. Of course, in the National League, there have been some memorable postseason games played at the Astrodome, the 80 series, Astros and Phillies, and then last year, the Mets in Houston, including the finale, the 16-inning classic. Here's Gibson in the fourth. Runs up, tries to drag one, instead pushes it. Foul on the third base side. And we may be fortunate because the warnings by the weather people in this area said if you still have tomato plants out, you better cover them because there's a threat of snow north and east of here coming out of Alberta, Canada, and it could get down to below freezing later tonight. So where are your long johns, Robert? Sort of makes you appreciate indoor baseball. If there's one redeeming value that may be it tonight. One and only one. Well, it was 48 at game time. It's already dropped five degrees. Two balls and a strike to Gibson. The humidity is usually a factor. The higher the humidity here with all these people in our conditioning, the farther the ball flies. Change of speeds again. Ties Gibson up. Two and two. Gibson really did not end the season on a bank. Sparky knows that, but he's not going to take a guy with his speed who goes first and third and chase the ball in the outfield and the left here, field here, which is big, out of his lineup, obviously, even against a good left-hander. Gibson playing with a little pulled hamstring. But the biggest hit of the season, perhaps, for the Tigers, Hernans was a big one on Sunday, but when Toronto won the first three games up in the Exhibition Stadium, Canada, he hit the home run to tie it in the fourth game, and that may have been the biggest hit of the year for them, like Pendleton's home run against the Mets. Another 2-2 pitch. Pops out of the glove, and he got a little piece of it. So Viola is denied, at least temporarily, his sixth strikeout. Laudner couldn't hold it. He struck him out on a pitch like that back in the first. And almost duplicated it here. Gibson will be followed by Trammell and Herndon in the top of the fourth. 1-1 one, one tie. Broken bat roller towards short. Here's Gagney. Unloads quickly and got him. Gagney had him played towards second base. He had to cut back to his right and make a backhand play. Viola saw Gibson's bat off and perhaps the smartest player on this team, and most of the coaches say it, is Greg Gagney, the shortstop. He doesn't have tremendous abilities. their best base runner. You can see how he played the turf, surrounded it for Gibson's speed, got off a good throw with something on an outstanding throwing arm and very accurate. Travels over one. Strike one. Well, before the ball game, the PA announcer read some copy written by some PR directors from the American League, approved by the American League, saying the odds on favorite for MVP is Trammell. Trammell doesn't say that. Lombardosi goes back to make the catch. And Kirby Puckett barely made it into your picture. He plays a very, very deep center field. What you're looking at between those two, Bal gives you more instant offense. You factor in the defense of Trammell, a, one of the most important positions aside from catching day in and day out. Trammell gets points on that. But Trammell also hitting fourth will get a lot of cheap, cheap RBIs, and that's not a knock at Trammell in the Tiger lineup. That's why Spark hit him fourth, because he doesn't strike out, but he puts the ball in play. One 0 
pitch to Herndon. Now his delivery has settled down. That first inning when Viola was throwing so hard, he may have even been overthrowing the adrenaline, as you said. Now he is smooth. He's got a nice rhythm, and he's still popping the ball well. He's not muscling it. Ground ball just foul. It's conceivable if Kelly doesn't want to use Necro as his game four starter that Viola could come back on three days rest and in theory he could pitch games one four and seven but a lot of that depends upon his tender shoulder which has given him problems within the past month Kelly flatly says I won't jeopardize his career regardless of the series standing. Yeah, like Tom Kelly told us before the ball game, he said, "Hey, look, there are 125 ball games that are struggling. And there are 125 ball games that are easy. I don't know how a game like this of this importance about it could be easy." Bounce down to Gaetti. And a one-two-three top half of the fourth. Still tied at one in the Metrodome. What a contrast when you look at the Skippers. Sparky, a household name, been in the World Series five times, one at three, and a guy like Tom Kelly who could go on What's My Line in full uniform and stump the panel. A three-game series that Sparky Anderson managed against the Blue Jays on that last weekend, those three exciting games, he showed me he's a great manager. He understands pitching, I think. He knew he had to pitch around with Fernandez and Witt out of the lineup, three and five hitters, which probably sent them here, not Toronto, having those two out. And he just kept pitching around George Bell. Gagney, Puckett, and Herbeck in the fourth. A strike on the outside corner. Or close to the outside corner. And Doyle will keep it out there, too. As long as he keeps getting the call, and then what happens is the hitters get closer to the plate if you're right-handed. They start going into the ball to reach the outside corner, and then it makes them inside much more effective where you can bust their bats. He's having a little trouble. That's the second or third time he's just thrown the ball right out past <laughs> Don Alexander. He is not one of those who has a middle block. There have been some that that's happened. Remember Mike Ivey? He couldn't throw it back. Heath was a major disappointment for the Cardinals after they dealt Joaquin Andahar to the A's for him prior to last year. So they let him go, gave up on him, and he's found the groove again in Detroit. He's contributed with the bat, and his throwing has returned. He's been very effective there. Bouncer to Trammell. Four gold gloves for him, three for his partner, Whitaker. There he is again, right up the middle of the diamond where Don Alexander's trying to make him hit it. Trammell and a lot of the Tigers were talking before the ball game in their clubhouse about a very class guy who sent a telegram, Lance Parrish, wishing them the best of luck. Uh, and really, there were a lot of guys in the verge of tears when they saw his beautiful telegram. And you just mentioned Heath and Noakes. And they've got over 100 RBIs between them. So they didn't lose his RBIs, Lance Parrish, but they sure miss a lot of other things about him. Kirby struck out to end the last half of the first. Hopper to Whitaker. Chest high bounce, and that takes care of Kirby Puckett, who's now 0 for 2. Up till two years ago, that's the way Kirby Puckett hit. No home runs the first year, four home runs the second. Beat down on the ball. He had like 25 bunt base hits his first season. He hadn't even tried to bunt this year. A lot of balls he beat out. Now he's starting. Once in a while he gets in that groove, he just starts to defensively swing for the opposite field. This one looks like it'll make the seats, and it does. Low ball hitter will chase fastball up and in. And you might see a Doyle Alexander go up and in, up and in bad. But then, with that short porch in right field, we talked about this earlier. Alexander runs the fastball away so well with such good action. He can pitch outside, and he'll make him hit it to center field. Herbeck has the power to center field to hit it out there. So, no matter what scouting report, sometimes tell you, a pitcher has his own idea, and he'll do it his own way, depending on what pitch is working and the feel he has when he hits the mound. Especially Alexander. Even with a veteran catcher like Heath, Alexander's calling his own game. 
He has his own set of sides. He brings wherever he goes. So if you try and steal sides from the center field camera, you can forget it. The shakes of the head and wipes with the glove, add, subtract, change location. Here's a drive, and Whitaker leaps to spirit. What the players call an atom ball. Hit hard, but right at him. Back after these messages from your local station. Well, Gaetti's going to be the leadoff man in the bottom half of this inning. Earlier, he had them waving the Homer hanky. <laughs> what are you? What? The Homer hanky? What is this? That's what it is. It's a big hit record around here. Well, I know in college you're a lit major reading Homer and all this, but a Homer hanky? <laughs> you come up with it, man. Top half of the fifth. Lemon, Evans, and Brookins. If anybody gets on, it'll be Heath. His homer tied the game after Gaetti had given the Twins the brief 1-0 lead. Sky high pop, Herbeck back, calls Lombardozzi off, and squeezes it. And most first baseman, you mentioned this earlier, Bob, would have just given away to the second baseman. Herbeck with those great hands. Sometimes they put the clutches at first base who can't move, usually, or sometimes can't throw. But not with Herbeck. Like the rest of his teammates, Frank Viola has found home cooking especially tasty. Evans fouls it off. Viola hasn't lost at the Metrodome since May 22nd. The Tigers and Jack Morris beat him that night, 3-2. Wasn't it interesting talking to him yesterday during the workout when players are much more accessible before the game, talking about the greatest game he ever saw, the Ron Darling Viola game? Mm. Tell you about it after this pitch to Evans. Took something off, and Evans is out in front. Viola pitching for St. John's and Darling for Yale in an NCAA playoff game. Dual 12 innings before Viola won it, one nothing. But he said, I pitched a six hitter and felt like I was losing because Darling threw a no hitter through 11. Evans goes the other way and Gagne can't come up with it. He was trying to shuffle his feet so he could get position. Remember, on the artificial surface, unlike when we go to Detroit for game three, you can go straight at the ball. Break your speed by sliding with your right foot in the dirt and even the grass sometimes and come up throwing. Here, you've got to use those little choppy steps or surround the ball to get an angle. And he was starting to use those choppy steps to get position to throw, and he really couldn't get in front of the ball. That is rightly ruled a hit. It might surprise you to learn that the Twins made fewer errors than any team in the American League. Just 98. Brookings. In the air to left center field, Gladden will have room. The first goes Evans with two out. Gladden, who has been a surprise, remember with the San Francisco Giants under Frank Robinson a few years back, he was a center fielder, had a high on base percentage. When they put him to left field, they weren't sure he'd do a good job. But that's a pretty big left field out there, and he's really done well, and he's throwing better than they thought he could. He could be very important as a leadoff hitter. If he can get on base so they can't pitch around what they call the big four here, he could be very important in the series. Dan Gladden with his running speed. Heath burned Viola his last time. This time a slow roll at a short, and Gagne goes the short way around Verdozzi for the force. Evans' single is wasted to the last of the fifth to go. You got to look at tonight's pitching story, Alexander dueling with Viola. And the hitting story thus far, Gaetti and Heath with the solo homers. Two different style of pitchers. Viola pretty much more of a hard throw. Alexander more of a finesser, control, movement on the ball. The G-man, Gary Gaetti. Ralph Hawk was talking about him, saying, I don't know how he can drive in 100 runs as he did when most of the bases have been cleared by the hitters hitting in front of him. Puck hitting Herbeck, he said. That shows you how many important base hits he's got in key situations. 
It's no day at the beach against Alexander, but you couldn't tell from where Gaetti was perched. It's not often that you see lovely lawn furniture like that in a big league ballpark. Bush and Bernanski will follow Gaetti. Last half of the fifth. He's going for number two. It's way back. It's out of here. First pitch of the inning. The only question about that one was whether or not it would be high enough. It was a bullet that barely got over the low fence, the seven foot high fence. Well, Alexander barely trying to get the ball down and away. Unlike the first home run, but it was an off speed pitch. He got this one out and up over the plate also. They want Gaetti out, but there in game number one, he not getting involved in many histrionics. Now he didn't want to come out. He finally looks his age at 53. It's hard to believe with the snow white hair that he was only 36 when he first burst on the national scene with the Reds in 70. Down the right field line, fair ball. It bounces against the canvas, is in play. Top pop. Bush wants a triple. the canvas look what happens it doesn't really carry him back to Herndon and then with some crazy English it kicks away from him had it hit lower on the fence it would have taken a more conventional bounce back toward it plus they worked out yesterday early today he doesn't know this part as well as his own and he has a terribly bad knee which hurts him on the artificial surface and he really can't get after balls figuring they're going to be more runs. He's got the infield back all the way. A bullet hit back to Brookins. He might come home. They're going to concede the run this early. So Sparky figures there's going to be a lot more to come in this ballgame as far as runs. Bush at third. Nobody out. If you get down to the eighth and ninth hitters, Lombardozzi and Laudner, situation changes. But this guy's a slugger. The only thing you got to worry about the way Viola's been pitching and with the adrenaline, as you said, going, Reardon's there. And the the way he's been pitching, you get into the eighth or ninth, and Viola can't last, it changes. Another extra base hit. In comes Bush. Brunanski has a double. She's thrown that's been mashed has been up in the strike zone. Early part of the game, most of it was off the outside corner away and down low. Had the twin swing at some bad pitches. Now he's gotten them up. McDoyle pitched with three days rest at times at the end of the season, although not his final performance. Could he have been worn down a little bit? 
They've got the bullpen up as Heath went out for a conference stall for a little bit of time. In tight at the corners now. Looking for the but excellent butter, Lombardozzi. He bunts toward first. Evans tags him as he goes by. Successful sacrifice. Dan Petrie. He fits well in long relief as the Falkert is a starter coming off the elbow surgery. And the start late in the season. Didn't do well starting. So now there'll be another conference to try and buy some more time for Dan Petrie. And we'll assume infield coming all the way or at least halfway on this artificial surface for London. When you've got a guy like Reardon, it changes the strategy. Tom Kelly about as cool as can be as you see. But when you've got a closer like Reardon's been for this ball club, you've got to change your defense this early in the game. Struck out his first time, and Alexander is thinking strikeout here. Gaetti Homer. That made it 2 1. Bush tripled. Runansky doubled at home. Now Bruno has been moved to third by Lombardozzi's sacrifice. The Twins very aware they've got at least split, and they feel a lot better if they can win the first two here before the trip. Laudner's behind 0 and 2. In the infield, Whitaker playing halfway, and that's because he has such a good throwing arm, one of the best for second baseman. You can see Trammell, who's had the arm problems on the left side, even though it's a right-handed hitter, playing in because his throwing arm is not as strong as it used to be. Alexander has lasted at least six innings in all 11 of his Tiger starts on the ropes here in the fifth. felt that Laudner hanging over the plate maybe looking change up and then fouling the fastballs off came inside once sometimes his pattern will be bust him inside once again and try and get the weak grounder to the strike down coming in again when you see Don Alexander sweep down twice he was either changing the location or adding in or subtracting to the count Don Sutton, of course, would know that system. It was taught for years. The Dodger organization with Don Alexander started, as did Sutton. Alexander trying to finish Laudner, who struck out 80 times in 288 at bats. What a horrendous ratio. Romanski at third with one out. Struck him out. That's four for Alexander. It's one of those situations where you would rather have had at the plate Tom Kelly a finesse hitter where you might throw the thought of a squeeze play instead of a slugger who strikes out a lot. And that's usually the kind of guy you've got in the ninth spot. A guy who can bunt, keep something going, or get it going for the one and two hitters with the DH in this league. Gladden swings and misses.
legitimate base dealers on first base right now. Alexander, quick move to first and unloads home in a hurry, similar to what we saw the Vin and Jones game yesterday. The way Russia can unload home quickly to allow the catcher to get Vince Coleman. Latin has swiped 25. Not going. Check swing foul. Gladden had some injuries, had a leg problem, which really perhaps cut his base dealing total down. When they knew they wanted to move Kirby Puckett into the three spot to take advantage of his RBI and home run power, they were looking for the leadoff hitter. And this guy came along, even though his on-base percentage is not that high, he has the ability to get on base. Rick Rennick flashing the signs from the third base coach's box. Twiggy, Wayne Terwilliger is the coach at first, veteran baseball man. Diving back is Gladden. umpire looking closely that no ball move is committed and that finishes Gagne but the twins hit for the cycle in the inning homer by Gaetti triple by Bush double by Bernanski single by Gladden 4-1 Minnesota Through the first four innings, Doyle Alexander got very few pitches up in the strike zone and not where he wanted them. He got a high fastball up to Gaetti in the second and a home run to dead center field. And then leading off the fifth, looked like a sidearm off-speed pitch. And Doyle is checking with his catcher, Mike Heath. Was that one up also? And most of them were in the fifth when the Twins scored three runs. One and out of Whitaker, leading off in the sixth. Here's the pitch Gaetti crushed. Either little slider or that changeup. A chopper to her back. Easy chance. One out. Up comes Madlock. Let's see how Viola works to him. Steve Horn charting the pitches for us up here in the booth points out that Viola got him on fastballs busting him inside in the first then in the third all breaking balls away and he struck him out with that. This is a weak pop up. And he's done on the first pitch. Madlock once again having difficulty getting around in a fastball up and in so Viola who when he first came up was a thrower. He's now been able to spot the ball just a little bit. That at bat, it looked like Madlock moved off the plate. You can wait a little bit longer in the fastball. He hit a little bit farther back in the strike zone, but he still couldn't get around on the Viola fastball. It's hard to imagine as you look at Gibson, who's been a very prominent and celebrated player for several years. He's never made the all-star team, not even as a reserve. Neither has he ever become the superstar people said he would be. He is a very good player, not a great player. But there are times when he can seize a game with his raw physical talent, as he did in the 84 World Series against the Padres. And Sparky's already admitted when Gibson first came up, the worst statement he ever made was saying that Gibson is like Mickey Mantle. Well, he's got the power of Mantle, the speed near Mantle's. Didn't throw like Mickey, but he never had done it. Exuberance is one thing, sacrilege is another. Oh. Hold on to your bubblegum card. <laughs> In your breast pocket. Two and one. And here's a long blast. Brunanski back. He's a spectator. No. 
and hit the canvas on the backside. Gibson wasn't sure either. He held up until the umpire said, yeah, it did. It's what, over. What Gibby saw was the ripple in the canvas. He thought it hit the canvas and was in play, but it hit off the facade and hit the canvas on the backside. This Tiger team scored just under 900 runs during the 162-game season. Very few teams in baseball history have done that, not for a long while. He wasn't sure, but the ball just keeps on going in this nice, humid, warm air tonight. Now he rechecks, and the second base umpire, Drew Coble, said, yeah, you got one, Gibby. Viola got behind, and he sat on the fastball. A strike to travel, so four homers tonight. Ethan Gibson for the Tigers, two of them for Gaetti of the Twins. Well, it is the Homer Dome again tonight. Maybe tomorrow if it stays cold, nor a condition, a lot of people. Trammell didn't get all of this one. Gladden in left center. The Homer by Gibson cuts into the Tiger deficit as we head for the last of the sixth. It's four to two. Dome, but truly it hasn't been as you see several clubs had more sail over the fences in their home parks than did the twins and even more revealing there were 198 homers hit in twins games here there were 208 homers hit in twins road games this season but it's been a homer dome tonight sure with four. Herbeck and that man again, Gaetti. Ball one low. The only club in baseball history with four 30 home run hitters, Tommy Lasorda's 1977 Dodgers. The Twins came close. Into center field, Lemon got a late break, but he gets there. He plays very deeply, just as you mentioned earlier, that Puckett does. Alexander got a ball into the fists of Kirby. Jammed him just a little bit and flared it. Well, the middle relievers have gone down to the bullpen for Tom Kelly's twins. Schatzitter's down with the only left-hander. Atherton, Frazier, Beringer. Joe Nico may be there, but it's not yet time, perhaps the seventh inning, when Reardon will amble down. Herbeck bounces one toward Whitaker. Nonchalantly takes care of it. top 30 homers. Puckett came close with 28. A little extra and a little more focus on trying to keep the ball this time, at least for the first pitch on Gaetti. Alexander's been burned twice by Gary on balls up and out over the plate. championship series game at Kansas City in 85 when George Brett hit two homers off Alexander and missed a third by about a foot as he got a double off the top of the right field fence. So Alexander has been roughed up in the playoffs before. That of course was when Doyle was with Toronto. Held up two and one. Gaetti has gotten to the point in his career now where he will look for pitches, change his stance, look away, look in. It is a great hitter's pitch seemingly, but here's the time where Don Alexander likes to pull the string. 
Good fastball. Into shallow center field this time. And Lemon puts it away. A perfect sixth. And Gaetti finally proves human. We'll be right back after these messages from your local station. American League Championship Series is brought to you by Acura Legend and Integra Precision Crafted Automobiles exclusively at your Acura dealer and by Dean Witter will help manage your investments based on your individual needs. You know Bob they talk about never having enough left-handed pitchers when you're playing the Eastern Division Club whether it's Toronto the Yankees or Detroit. Well Minnesota has just Dan Schatzeter, and he has struggled off and on this year. Some wonder and said, hey, why didn't they have Steve Carlton active? Well, one day, Carlton lefty was taken off the roster for paperwork. They activated Don Baylor to get the DH. Don Baylor really hadn't produced that many home runs, none, in fact, for them. But you wonder if that's going to catch up to them with just Schatzeter. Another guy they could have put on the playoff roster, Mike Smithson, who struggled this year, had to be sent down to the minors for a while, but Smithson has twice been a 15-game winner. There's Baylor, who is the only non-pitcher on the Twins' present roster with any postseason experience. And, of Two. course, he's got plenty of it with the Angels, the Orioles, and last year the Red Sox. Minnesota with nine pitchers, Sparky Anderson with ten. a 4-2 lead to the seventh. Just how important is this outing by Viola to the Twins' chances? Well, you're looking at a guy in Viola who has an ERA more than a run lower than any other Twins pitcher. The Tigers are barely a 500 club against left-handers, and they have a terrific record against righties. Herndon hits one softly into center, and Puckett will not get to this. So it's a leadoff hit for Herndon. Now, tomorrow night, as good as Burt Blylevin is, you've got a guy who's given up 50 and 46 home runs the last two years, the highest two-season yield in baseball history. Sparky's team is primarily left-handed in terms of power. Here's Blylevin charting pitches tonight. Burt in a transition portion of his career after the high homer total last year. He's walked a lot more this year. Changing speeds more, but we'll see what he does tomorrow. Lemon. Wraps one. Gagney can't get it. Herndon will stop at second, and the Tigers have something going in the top of the seventh. Jeff Reardon next to Tony Oliva, the man, along with Tom Kelly, almost every player said has made the biggest difference on this ball club. And Tom Kelly has used him so well. He only had 33 or 40s at the All-Star break. He said, this is the first time in my career that I've come into September and now October without a bad elbow. He's throwing the ball very well. There are safe totals. And Detroit's collectively. Kelly has his bullpen up. Juan Berenguer, who pitched for the Tigers in their World Championship season of 84, now with the Twins. And they have meal money in Minnesota as well, as you see. Evans takes a strike. So if the Twins relinquish this lead, you really can't like their chances tomorrow night, especially with Jack Morris, who's 12 in all lifetime against Minnesota, set for the Tigers. Line drive, base hit. Herndon held up, and the bases are loaded on three consecutive singles. We talked before about a, you know, this isn't a collection of great players. There are some great ones on this Detroit team, but collectively and the way they execute, they will make a pitcher throw strikes. 
If their pitchers will make the opposition hit balls and get themselves out. Sparky not only charts his own pitchers, he watches series of pitches and what the catcher th calls. And maybe they're catching on Viola because maybe Sparky's charting has now found a sequence in the pitches of Viola. He's got a tough thing to pitch out of right now. Field looks for the double play. Brookins 0 for 2. Now it's important for Viola to try and stay with himself. He overthrew that pitch, lost the strike zone completely. In his past, up until a year or so ago, and he doesn't do it anymore. He was very volatile on the mound. Air behind him, a couple of base hits. Something went wrong, the ball wasn't caught, he could explode. He now has his emotions more under control, and he needs to control them right now. Top half of the seventh, Twins four, Tigers two, bases loaded, nobody out. Keith, who homered earlier, is on deck. Hold the string. He threw a with the seam fastball, a sinker baller's grip, and got the running action, moving away, and also a little singing action to try and get the double play. Herndon, Lemon, and Evans lead away. Laudner the sign, Viola the pitch. Two and one. He just aimed that ball. He didn't have much on that last pitch, Bob. He was trying to sink it again, and luckily it drifted out of the strike zone. He didn't have much on it. It's not the time to go out there in this situation and say, here it is, the batting practice fastball, which some pitchers throw. That'll make the seats two and two. strikes. Viola has struck out five, but none since he got Madlock to end the third. Brookins has one career grand slam, hit it earlier this year against the Twins. sinker that time, wasn't it, Bob? You talked about the composure cited by Kelly and the pitching coach Dick Such. The way Viola will not be rattled in situations like this, as he might have been a couple of years ago. Gathering himself now to work to Heath, who's homered and grounded out. to ball. Gagne pinched towards second base. Gaetti near the line at third. A lot of room in that hole between the two of them. As long as Viola keeps running the ball away, that's where Gagne's going to play in the middle of the diamond. Doesn't feel that Brookins will be able to hurt him to his right. One and one. And he 
he's got a groove on that outside corner now with that sinker. This is where Laudner will have to watch the foot placement and the approach of Heath. If he gets closer to the plate, they may want to bust him inside. Out of play. A ball and two strikes. Decision. Do I stick with the sinker now and try and run it, keep it down, middle of the part out, or do I go four seamer and say, here it is, hit it? He may just come in and throw as hard as he can with a four seamer. Line drive, base hit that could tie the game. One run home. Puckett with a great arm, and they hold the others. And look at that throw. Alex Kramis knows the arm strength and the accuracy of Puckett, one of the best in this league. He plays deeply, but on this turf, the ball got to be run. He went on a 3-2 and two pitch, a fastball, four-seamer, had to throw a strike, thought he could pop him up or strike him out. And look at Kirby get a great position throw and a one-hopper to Tim Lawton. The respect that the Greek, Alex Gravis, has for that man's throwing arm. But four singles have drawn Sparky's club to within one, and the bases are loaded with just one out. He's brought a trip from Dick Sutch, who was a pitching coach for the Texas Rangers, the Doug Raider. He's very soft-spoken man who understands people along with the mechanics of pitching. Again, in my mind, and I think in the minds of most other observers, this is the big game for the Twins. No disrespect intended toward Blylevin, who's been one of the game's best pitchers the last decade and a half. But the convergence of factors just doesn't bode well for the Twins tomorrow night. I feel they must get a victory here. Well, the thing about it is Detroit has been weak against left-handers. You're dealing with one of the best left-handers in the league. You beat him. It's got to be a letdown for this Twins team. Although they haven't let down all year through all the adversity they've been in. All right, Whitaker. Possible double play. They're coming home, though. And they get the force. And that was the right decision because oh, yeah. it was not hit hard enough. It's a left-handed hitter in Whitaker, even though Whitaker does have a bad instep, not running as well as he ordinarily does. Herbeck showed you not only his ability to charge the ball, watch it. He knows he's got to go get the ball, charge it, made his own hop. Show the strength and accuracy of his arm. Herbeck is one of the best in the business at turning the 3-6-3, but not on that ball as I had originally thought for two reasons. Hit too slowly, and he couldn't retreat to the bag quickly enough as he had to come off to make the play, so he made the right choice. Bases loaded, two out. Plus, you had Heath coming off first base, who's a very aggressive slider with a big lead, and he had just torn somebody up at second base. One and on to Madlock, who hasn't had even a cent of Viola. Struck out twice and popped up. Tigers got the minimum out of four singles. Just one run.
designated hitters, domes, astroturf, but one thing hasn't changed for decades and decades. Pulses still race in October when the money is on the table. And watch the sigh of relief from Viola. If he doesn't get that ball, Bob, Lombard knows he's going to get it. But he's going to have to eat it. One run, and then you've got Gibson who homered off Viola the next time, stepping in with the bases loaded. So he made a good play. And he's not known to be an outstanding fielder. Madlock, the DH, who's now 0 for 4. Randy Bush had a triple in the three-run fifth. lighting up there three years ago there seemed like there were one or two every series especially in that center field area Brunanski wallops one but Gibson is there it was hit hard but almost in his tracks Kirk makes the catch for the second out and again we remind you that we'll select the NBC Miller Lite player of the game at the conclusion of the contest One of the big questions asked about the Tigers that, in fact, Kirby Puckett and a lot of the others mentioned, could they get aroused for this league championship series after what they had to go through against the Toronto Blue Jays? Seven games, all decided by one run. The total score was 25 to 24. That's how close those seven games were. Could they be flat? Viola that good. Well, meanwhile, the Twins kind of meandered into the playoffs, losing their last five after clinching the American League West. They were actually a game under 500 after the All-Star break. With their 85 wins, the Twins would have finished fifth in the American League East. Bouncer toward the hole. Trammell from what would be the outfield grass doesn't get it. the right foot he's in shallow left field he did get a lot on the throw but with Lombardozzi swinging getting a good step or two out of the box a good jump traveled it all he could this team not gifted with a lot of blazers but the meat of the diamond for this Minnesota team has been very important short second they contribute a lot of little ways they do not yet have the exposure of Whitaker and Trammell may never be that good but they're not bad Two K's next to Laudner's name in the scorebook and strike one to him here. You know, you can see why the Tigers are such an overwhelming favorite. They were 13 games better than the Twins. The Twins would have been behind the Tigers, the Blue Jays, the Brewers, and the Yankees if you put them in the East. Back to Alexander. High throw, but Evans is able to handle it. We move on to the eighth. Viola doesn't have much margin of error left. And let's see if we even see him or if it'll be Reardon. Off with the jacket. He's coming back. Well, that man down on the lower portion of Tom Kelly's scorecard, and a little unusual, he's listed along with the left-handed pitchers, but it's Jeff Reardon, and it must be very comforting for Frank Viola, as it has been for all of these starters all year, that if we get into the eighth, we can just let it all hang out, throw as hard as we can go after this, because Jeff is sitting there behind us. Complete games? Not many. A lot of it because that man on the left, Jeff Reardon. Last year, the Twins, who had a woeful pitching staff then, actually led the American League in complete games. Not because their starters were so good, but because their bullpen was so terrible. One and one to Gibson, who homered his last time up. It's 
been a crazy year for the Tigers. Unlike 84, when they got off to that fantastic start and breezed in, Gibson was out travel for a while early. They started out 10 and 19, and then played like crazy the rest of the way. Another good change, one and two. Since that low point that you mentioned in May, when they were eight, nine games under 500, they've played 660 baseball, the best in the majors. How about the Minnesota Twins? They actually, during the 162 game schedule, gave up more runs than the opposition, and they're here in the league championship series. They scored less than their pitchers gave up. Full count now. Seven. He's the youngest major league manager by a matter of months. Bobby Valentine also 37. John Waffen, the new Kansas City pilot, just turned 38 this week. And many outsiders don't get to see the fun side of Tom Kelly. We saw a little bit of it yesterday and today. And we'll do it again. Could Tom Kelly and Dick Sutch, who right when this inning started, had reared and warmed it up. Could they just be letting Viola get the leadoff hitter Gibson, and then you've got a string of Trammell, Herndon, Lemon, three right-handed hitters? Possibility, depending upon how Viola throws to him and how he's feeling if they ask. So what I don't want to do against Sparky is bring the right-handers in too soon, because he's got some left-handers on the bench. Oh, he went to the changeup. Three and two, change off the curve, and missed with it. So Gibson, who can run, he's stolen 26, is aboard with a tying run. And Reardon wondering when the phone's going to ring. Well, you know Trammell is going to hit. It's a hanging curveball, and... Not too many years ago, with the inflated protectors, that ball's a strike. It's one of those where it's unfair to the pitcher. If a hitter wants to hack at it, he can beat the heck out of the hanger, but if he takes it, it's a ball. Tom Kelly is not going to be too quick to get Viola out. Not with the lead he's got. Doesn't seem like much at slim, but what you've got is Matt Noakes bat sitting on the bench, and he would come in probably for Herndon, or maybe Johnny Grubb, or Bergman, or Sheridan, but more likely Noakes if there's a man out. The 0 1 pitch to Trammell. Liner over Lombardozzi's leap, and on the turf, it gets deep into the gap. It'll be a double for Trammell. And on to third is Gibson. Second and third, nobody out. That's a single at Tiger Stadium. Now he's going to have to worry over what he's going to do. And you can see it's the first signs of uneasiness that Tom Kelly has shown. He is saying, what matchup do I want? Viola against Herndon or the possibility of Reardon against Matt Noakes? Possibility. Because then you've got two catchers, you lose notes early in case you want to pitch it for Heath later. So that changes things with this 24-man roster. He wants Reardon. Now if Sparky pulls Herndon back and sends up notes, they have a base open. The go-ahead run is at second then. So they could walk notes if he gets up there and set up the double play or the force at the plate. He has Bergman, who is a veteran hitter, and here comes Dave. We'll save notes for another time. The ERA was inflated early when Reardon struggled in April and May. After the All-Star break, he's been the kind of pitcher they thought they were getting when they swapped Neil Heaton to the Expos for him. Fastball in the low 90s. 
good straight change and a pretty decent curveball. So he's got three pitches. A lot of relievers, short relievers have just two. Bergman swings on the first one. Fly ball that'll be deep enough to tie the game, but watch Trammell at second. Puckett charging. Play at third, no. Trammell was able to tag in advance. Herbeck, as he cut it off, had an idea. So now Viola will be denied the win. And if Trammell scores, Viola, despite his heroic effort, could lose. Kirby tried to get a running start to get an angle to get more impetus on his throw home, and he actually waited too long and came on the run and didn't get as much as he usually does on the throw. They do what they have to do, don't they? They're a real group of veterans. A little sack fly, they usually get it. Two years ago wasn't the same after the 84 season. Look at Tim. I don't know if he lost the ball in the thing, and then all of a sudden he rushed up on the ball and made a very, very short throw. If he makes a throw, they might have cut it off and got the runner at third. Infield moves in, and Lemon takes a ball. Twins had a 4-1 lead. Tigers have come back a run at a time. Homer by Gibson in the sixth. Four singles for a run in the seventh. And one more here to even it. Good breaking ball. It is quick and it just keeps fighting. Years pass when the arm got tired, that breaking ball would just sit there and hang for some of those hitters. In the air to right field, and the Tigers are going to have the lead. Brunanski makes the catch in foul ground, so in theory, he didn't have to catch that. Except but he didn't know that as right. he crossed the line. He did he not know right. The ball just kept drifting. He was going to try and get an angle to throw home, which was impossible because he came so far from right center field. But again, what do you do? A split-second decision. Maybe Bernanski never even thought of it. But right there, it may have been fair, Bob. It's difficult to tell unless you're shooting right down the line. And you take the sure out when you can get it. If he knows it's definitely foul, he'd have to make a decision and maybe let it go because it was too deep. He makes a decision because it's right on the line if he even thought about it. Good call by you, Bob. Evans is two for three. The Tigers have their first lead. And what you go back to on that is Kirby Puckett, who was so aware in the outfield, when he came home from so deeply, if he had gone to third or hit the cutoff man, perhaps Trammell might not have gotten the third, but those are all the might ofs that are magnified in these kinds of series. Two and one to Evans. The base is empty now with two out. They produced these two runs on only one hit. In contrast to the seventh, where four singles produced only one. Gibson walked, Trammell doubled into the gap in right center, and all of a sudden Alexander's back in business with a lead, and then sacrifice flies by Bergman and Lemon got the job done. The Sparky Vaughn late in the season was both been struggled. He would stick with his starters until their arms fell off. He did that pretty much in the series in Detroit against Toronto. You know, it's going to be interesting in all the post-game press conference. If we still got some time to go from Minnesota over the bat, you can bet that Tom Kelly's going to be asked the question: Why would Trammell the cleanup interrupt? Did you think of going to rear to get Trammell before the base hit off Viola? Viola appeared to be throwing the ball pretty well. Well, we've gotten out of a close call in the seventh. This ball's hit down the line. Brunanski racing over, and he makes the running catch again in foul ground. Two more 
cracks at it for Minnesota. They'll have the top of the order in the last of the eighth. There was no play at the plate, so why didn't Puckett throw to third and hold Trammell at second? Well, you will watch Ken Herbeck on this replay. If he gets the ball in the fly to start with, now, as you said, Herb Kirby could have gone right to third, and you can see where Trammell is. Just about two-thirds down. If Herbeck gets it on the fly, not the short hop, he may get him even at that, but he had a battle to hop. So, little things that turn out to be big things if Detroit turns out winning it. If. from this shot. Sheridan, defensive player, out in right field for Sparky Anderson. Gladden to start it. Up the middle, and the time run is on for the Twins. Well, the age old baseball action as Willie Hernandez, the left-hander. Mike Kenneman, the right-hander. You played a tie at home and win on the road, but you can a stealing threat. He might take, it might be a straight, straight steal. You might try and hit and back up the infield. Brookins looking for a bunt, so there are three possibilities. Billy Muffet trying to check to see if they're ready in his pen. Brookins thinks he's bunting, and he's right. Toward first, Evans makes the running catch in foul ground. Perhaps a player that executes in almost all phases as well as anybody on this team, Greg Gagne. And Doyle Alexander got a pitch in on him with a little fastball and forced him to pop it up. The things they practiced on. The first off day, there were two before this started. Alexander, suspecting bunt, busts it up and in, trying to get the pop up, and he does. But. Two days ago, that's what Tom Kelly had his people out here doing. The pitchers have begun hitting and bunny to get ready for the World Series. With the DH fluctuating from park to park. He had his regulars bunting a lot to try and get the finesse plays down, and the practice didn't work in that instance. Kirby, Kirby, they chant. Anderson with Henneman and Hernandez getting ready, but sticking with Alexander for the time being. He was hitting latter part of the season until Tony Oliva said, look, you're floating back into your old pattern. Start driving the ball. And he drives this one into the gap in left center field. Lemon chasing after it, can't get it. It bounces off the plexiglass. Here comes the tying run. Play at the plate. Safe.
was a perfect relay. Lemon plays the carom off the glass very cleanly. Unloads to Trammell, who has a very strong arm, in perfect position. Right over Evans, the cutoff man. But Gladden slides in ahead of Heath's tag. Boots Day, one of those who did advanced scouting for Spark Anderson's Tiger, probably saw the same scouting reporter had it that we did. Pocket any more to right field. So they moved Lemon toward right center field. The gap was in left center. And then the speed of Gladden after a good jump gets him in. Finishes the walk. Alexander looking on. Hanneman is from St. Charles, Missouri. Played in two College World Series for Oklahoma State, where he was a teammate of the Rangers' Pete Incavilia. Gibson not very strong in left. Lemon good in center. Sheridan pretty good in right. And I think the numbers showed his performance against the Twins should be very tough on this right end of any lineup. If he keeps the ball down, which he usually does well, with the slider and fork ball, can be tough. Another of the many differences between this club and Sparky's 84 World Champions in this situation a few years ago, it's Hernandez right to the finish. And with the great screwball then, as effective against right-handed hitters as left. Same 
pitches that the veteran Alexander was getting early in the ball game, right near the outer edge. The rookie doesn't get it from Joe Brinkley. championship series. Hernandez yesterday after batting practice was up, pitched a simulated game to Whale Wonder and Lucida who are along for the ride although not eligible. As you might expect the moment Hernandez was announced the left handed hitting Bush was called back and out comes Don Baylor to hit for him. Struggling in their twins uniform in 20 ball games, no home runs, just six RBIs. Always the possibility he'll tuck that left shoulder into the strike zone and get hit. Ball one high. I think this will be the only man her will face and then he's gone. Ronaski is on deck. It nearly hit him. He's been hit 28 times this year to easily lead the majors. And he's got 255 career bruises to take baseball's all-time masochism award. The two all pitch. The 1979 MVP and the 84 MVP each past their peak. Who's got a little more left in this situation? Bases loaded, one out. Puckett with the lead run in a 5 5 game. Herbeck down at second. Gaetti who walked at first. Kelly now has the game set up the way he wants it. A lead with Reardon, his closer, coming out for the night. Back at 
third. Diani at second. Baylor, who knew what to do when they turned the spotlight on, is at first. And here's a shot that'll add more runs. It gets in the gap. Two are home. Baylor being waved home. They got a chance on him. And he's out at the plate. On a two-run double by Brunanski, that makes it eight to five. have lost their lead. And at least temporarily, the monkey off Tom Kelly's back. Hmm. Might have had a pitching change question. Sparky will have, be asked after the press conference, why did you leave Hernandez in when you had Eric King in to pitch to Tom Bernanski? Who may have broken it open? We'll find out. Four runs home in the last of the eighth. A hard throw who can have control problems. Good live fastball and hard slider. Next year, they say he'll be only a starter. As you wonder about Sparky's decision to stick with Hernandez, consider this. The last 15 hitters Hernandez has faced, he's retired only three of them. He's yielded seven hits and five walks in that stretch. Here's a little broken back loop. Whitaker retreats the catch. So that finishes it, but not nearly in time from the Tiger perspective. moment for a great veteran and this telecast was presented by authority of Major League Baseball may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Grubb bats for Brookins and on deck is Noakes to bat for Heath and then Whitaker in the top of the ninth. Reardon's got a three run cushion. The sign of a good relief pitcher in fact a great one at times and Jeff Reardon first pitch strike make them hit themselves out. Reardon would have preferred to save this. Instead, Viola isn't going to be involved in the decision, and Reardon could be the winner. Two and one. Right behind home plate, the gun is there, the radar gun, the speed gun. They used the slow gun here, and even on the slow gun this year at times, because Reardon's been fresh, he is up around 90 miles an hour. If you're using the fast gun like they've got in St. Louis, it might register three to five miles an hour faster. Well, he started him with a strike, but then misses with three. situations. Grubb spoils another one. Grubb can't catch up to his fastball at this point. Good low ball hitter. 
Reardon with that riding fastball has been upstairs with it pretty much. Looks like a hit. Brunanski won't get to it. So Grubb battled him. And on the third 3 2 pitch, he lines a single to right. So Sparky putting in Matt Noakes into the game now off a sensational rookie year. Noakes hit 32 home runs. And Sparky acknowledges that had they re-signed Parrish, there's no way Noakes would have even been on the roster. He would have been a Toledo Mudhead. Herbeck's going to cut the gap down. No sense holding a slower runner down up in age. Not with this score. Looks like Sparky flashed the sign to take one strike. Look at the run production Sparky's gotten from those two catchers. They thought they'd never replace Lance Parrish. A ball and a strike with Whitaker on deck. If Notes can reach, Blue becomes the tying run, and he has some power, 16 homers. Looking fastball in and down near the ankles. They said this series lacked marquee, especially from the twins' side. This has been an exhilarating opener. On the outside corner, and Noakes is finished. But he had made two more perfect breaking ball pitches. One down and in that Noakes question off Joe Brinkman. Then he backdoored him, started outside, and he threw it right where Laudner wanted it. And Joe Brinkman expands the strike zone just a little bit and punches Matt Noakes out. Whitaker. Madlock next, and if they can prolong it beyond him, Sparky would love to see Gibson get another swing. <laughs> Jeff Reardon makes the whole team feel better, doesn't he? The defense, the starting pitchers, the manager especially. They were swept in the first two American League playoffs by Earl Weaver's mighty Orioles, 69 and 70. Viola told us yesterday, I began to feel good about this ball club, which had been a perennial loser. After A, they hired Kelly. He was the player's choice. Others had been mentioned, Fry, Altabelli. And then when they got reared. Goes to three and one. Not only did that tell Viola and the other starters that they didn't have to pace themselves anymore, that Reardon was there to pick them up, but it told them, oh, Whitaker thought he had the walk, and now the count is full, and Brinkman's strike zone is expanding by the moment. The acquisition of Reardon told the Twins that the organization was serious about trying to win. Looks like it's a B game <laughs> down in Florida in March, doesn't it? Well, Andy McPhail wanted him, and then Ralph Howe came in and convinced 
Mr. Polad, the new owner, bought the club from Cal Griffith to hire Tom Kelly from within the organization. going to come to the plate in the person of Bill Madlock who's overdue. He had a woeful night against Viola. Struck out twice, popped out, and hit a comebacker with the bases loaded to end the seventh. And the one thing Lauder, I believe, and Reardon are talking about, going over the scouting report on Madlock, saying what the situation is, and I'm sure somewhere in there they're saying one thing we do not want to do is hang a breaking ball to Bill Madlock. Make him hit your good fastball. If you're going to show him a curveball, make sure it's down or out of the strike zone. They've been jamming it. Unless Madlock hits into a double play, they're going to have to face Gibson who homered earlier in this game and hit 24 during the season. And with Madlock being the tying run, Gaetti's right on the line. He's not going to get, he's going to, that's what Tom Kelly was doing, saying, get back, guard the line. No doubles here. On two. in Lauder's glove. Herbeck right on the line now. Again, just like Gaetti before. Tom Kelly's moved him right on the line. That's a tying run and Gibson at the plate. And the outfielder's only about a stride yep. on the warning track. Nothing over their heads or through the gaps. Oh, and two. Gibson way over anxious. Reardon said you want to swing it out, go up the ladder on you even higher. Reardon a pitch away from finishing with a flourish. He could strike out the side with a hit in the walk tossed in. 8 5 twins, top of the ninth. Minnesota wins it.
Miller Lite player of the game is Gary Gaetti with two homers, a walk, three runs scored. Miller Lite is happy to present a check for $1,000 in the name of Gary Gaetti to the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Down on the field with two of the heroes, Gaetti and Don Baylor. Here's Marv Albert. All right, Bob, and of course, Don Baylor has been through this kind of pressure situation many times. You've had a host of big hits. Where does this one rank? It has to rank at the very top because of the situation there. Eighth inning, bases loaded. You know, you can't hit into a double play. So I was concentrating uh, very good at the time, and uh, Hernandez gave me a pitch that I could hit. I, I missed probably a grand slam on the ball that fell back. All right, Don Baylor coming through with the uh, game-winning hit. Gary Gaetti has done it for Minnesota with the glove and the bat throughout the season. Gary Burt, uh, rather, uh, Doyle Alexander, a uh, man who has not given up uh, the home run ball. You surprised you able to wrap two off him? I was surprised to get the pitches I got to hit. They were a little up for his zone, uh, more like my zone than his zone. They weren't his pitches, but, you know, I had to capitalize on the mistake. All right, Don Sutton, who is uh, working the championship series with us, said you're the type of guy, and he's had first-hand experience, that will wait and wait for the proper pitch. Were you waiting for it? Well, I just wanted to get a good one up in the zone because he's a he's a sinker ball, low ball pitcher, and uh, I'm just looking for the ball, and he, he threw it up there. I just reacted. That's all. I do what I normally do. Swing hard in case I hit it. Don, there are many uh, Minnesota Twins who felt that this was a must game tonight, particularly in sending a message to the Tigers that, yes, the Metrodome is a very difficult place to uh, play. In fact, the Tigers won four of six during the regular season against Minnesota. Was it a must game for you fellas? There's no doubt. I'd like to get that first game put away, uh, tucked in the W column, and Viola pitched an outstanding game. So did Alexander, but it was a very good win for us. We have Y-11 going tomorrow, and that's a must win for them. You've had much success in the past, but in light of the experience with the Red Sox last season, is this a second chance for Don Baylor? Well, it's the second coming uh, when I'm called on now to, to get a pinch hit and clutch situation sometimes and uh, to hit off a left-hander, so I'm ready for the challenge. All right, Don Baylor with a game-winning RBI, Gary Gaetti with two home runs. Let's get back to the booth for Bob and Tony. All right, Marvin, there were other heroes. Reardon got the win. Viola not involved in the decision, but pitched very well. Kirby Puckett a game-tying double in the eighth before Baylor's winning hit. And Tom Brunanski had two doubles and three RBIs for the Twins. The 1987 American League Championship Series has been brought to you by Miller Genuine Draft. Cold-filtered draft beer. It's as real as it gets. Buy your Toyota dealer. Quality right down the line. Who could ask for anything more? Buy the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. No matter how far you go, Goodyear takes you home. And by Allstate, for home, auto, and life insurance, you're in good hands with Allstate. The executive producer of NBC Sports is Michael Weissman. The coordinating producer of NBC's baseball coverage is Harry Coyle. Tonight's game was produced by Ricky Diamond and directed by John Gonzalez. Pre-game produced by David Neal. Pre-game directed by Bob Levy. Don't forget, stay tuned for your local news, followed by The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson and then Late Night with David Letterman, except, of course, on the West Coast, where those programs will be seen at their regular time. Join us tomorrow night for Game 2 of the American League Championship Series starting at 8.30 Eastern Time. Until then, for Tony Kubek and our stat man up at the booth, Steve Horn, I'm Bob Costas. Tomorrow night, it'll be Jack Morris going against Burt Blylevin. Here's Gladden coming home with the game-tying run. They tacked on three after that. And for all the doubters, the Twins are very much for real. Good night, everybody.